again, first public meeting for the Concord Hazard Mitigation Plan update um, 2022. Um, and here's the agenda for tonight. Uh, since this is the second um, hazard mediation plan update to, um, that we're doing here, the first, uh, the latest one is in 2017. We'll just take a quick review again at the planning process, um, the climate um, climate change impacts relevant to Concord or the region, um, and review the top priorities from the municipal vulnerability preparedness um, exercise that you've done in a couple of years ago. And then the purpose, the main purpose um, for tonight is to leave time for the communities to have questions, feedbacks, and suggestions so that we can bring that in and incorporate into this uh, 2022 plan update. So I'll move through the slide deck, the slide deck really, fairly quickly, um, but I'll pause periodically for questions. Um, if you have any questions or comments um, at this time, feel free to add it to the chat. Unfortunately, with my setup, I can't see it, but um, when we pause and take a look, I'll, I'll look through um, and, and go through your questions and comments at that time. Great. So one more time um, before we start, I would like to acknowledge the leadership of uh, the Town of Concord's local hazard mitigation planning team. Um, as you can see here, we have participation across many of the town's departments um, and planet and boards and committee. Um, and also special thanks to, thanks to Walter um, for really playing the, the point of contact and leading this effort from the town. And, um, and I should also introduce myself. Um, my name is Van. I am Van Du. I am Senior Environmental Planner at the Metropolitan Area Planning Council, um, MAPC. And um, we're very grateful to be able to support um, this planning project for the town of Concord. Okay, so just a quick background on the hazard mitigation plan and the work that um, the local team is doing. So the Federal um, Disaster Mitigation Act was passed in the year 2000. It set um, a goal for all municipalities across the country to have um, a hazard mitigation plan. However, this is a goal, not an actual requirement. But FEMA does have a carrot um, for compliance, and that is um, that in order to be eligible for FEMA grants, both um, pre pre-disaster planning or post-disaster recovery, um, municipalities must have a hazard mitigation plan um, in, uh, in active mode, basic, uh, status, basically. And the impetus for these plans was that across the country, FEMA was seeing the cycle of disaster, rebuilding, and then the same disaster, damage, and rebuilding again and again. And so the hope is that through these plans, communities can um, identify the cr critical assets, infrastructure, identify priority actions to help mitigate and interrupt this cycle. Um, and obviously, uh, disaster events are costly to towns and to the residents and often involve a lot of human suffering. Um, the latest we see is with the Hurricane Ian um, that is uh, wreaking havoc in, um, in the aftermath um, still in, in the Tampa Bay area or South Florida. And so um, we hope to analyze our vulnerabilities and address them before the next disaster. And so this is the exercise that we're doing um, in, in this time this year. Um, a hazard mitigation plan, however, is not an emergency response plan, but there's a separate plan for that. Um, the hazard mitigation plan, or you'll, you'll see, hear me say HMP, assesses all the natural hazards and their level of risk and impacts to a community. Uh, there are different natural hazards to be considered. In its latest policy update in um, April this year, FEMA requires community to also take into consideration climate impacts. Um, this is not um, any any new <laughs> new news for Concord, really, because um, the town has been ahead of the game. It integrated climate change considerations into its latest plan back in 2017 and um, has done many different climate mitigation and resilience efforts since as well. Um, and so here are the hazard mitigation plan planning development steps. Um, I would say right now that the town together, the town has pretty much completed the first four 
steps of updating the hazards and, and critical infrastructure, um, identify existing mitigation measures and understanding the status of it. Um, this is, like, like I said, the first public meeting. Um, we will have a second meeting um, in, a, in the upcoming week or month um, so that we can kind of talk through um, uh, the, you know, your feedback, incorporating that into the plan, um, get your suggestions for mitigation strategies that will be developed um, at a later time in the, in the next couple of weeks. And here's a breakdown of, of the, the planning the engagement process and schedule. So again, right now we're um, at public meeting number one. Uh, we are soon to uh, organize the, the next local team meeting to take all these feedback and start drafting the plan. At the next public meeting in November sometimes, we will um, share out sort of the major findings and recommendations that will go into the plan update. And the uh, target is to submit this draft uh, plan to MEMA and FEMA um, for review in December. All right, so um, again, a quick review on climate change conditions and potential impacts to our region to conquer specifically where possible. Um, like I mentioned, this was um, the data is uh, taken from your uh, MVP planning exercise back in 2018, 2019. Um, and also data, regional and state data from uh, resilient Massachusetts um, kind of statewide uh, planning efforts there. And so what we see here, um, similarly across the, the state and, um, you know, there'll be, there are new rainfall patterns, more frequent and intense uh, precipitation volumes. Um, and that is going to just increase um, over the, the uh, you know, by mid and end of the century. Extreme heat, um, I think uh, it speaks for itself with what we've gone through this, this summer. Um, definitely there is an increase in annual, in average annual temperature as well. And the number of days with um, uh, high temperature will continue to, in, uh, to increase in extent as well. More frequent heat waves um, uh, as well. Uh, with that, also drought and floods, um, as well as extreme storms, hurricanes, remnants of hurricanes, and um, that is going to go through our region as well. Um, and most recently, um, well, as recent as 2016, um, Town of Concord did experience um, a tornado as well. So just to dive a little bit deeper, um, First, the impact, first impact and the one that fuels others is the increase in temperature. And so on the left side, you see um, the temperatures recorded at the Blue Hill Observatory. Um, and it shows that temperature has increased um, since the 1830 um, and recorded up, what I have is up to 2020. So that steady increase. Um, projections on the right side by their nature is data observed or documented. So you often see a range of projections because of the inherent uncertainty in predicting the future. Um, but yeah, you'll see that there's usually the uh, low and high um, models usually show the low and high um, emission scenarios here. So that you can see the potential for increase in annual average temperature for Middlesex County here by mid and end of the century. Um, based on the latest state data and the recent report completed by um, UMass Boston for the Greater Boston Climate Assessment, um, Concord's average temperature similar to Massachusetts is projected to increase. Uh, as you see here. Um, and the data also estimates that up to 32 days above 90 degree Fahrenheit um, by 2050. Currently, um, the average is around seven to eight days. And then between 14 to 72 days by the end of the century. And um, roughly up to 20 days above 100 degree Fahrenheit by the end of the century as well. Slide look at um, looks at the tree coverage, um, tree canopy in Concord, and um, it looks great. However, the pink area you see are um, identified as higher heat locations. 
So the data is captured using remote sensing and recording land temperatures on the cloudless day where temperature was um, over 90 degrees. Um, the pink, again, the, those hot spot represented the hottest 5% land temperatures in the uh, communities in the MAPC region. Um, so this is this, this is regional data, but you can see there that there are some hot spot um, identified in the town of Concord. And so this is probably most relevant issues um, for uh, residential clusters or uh, within these hot spot. Um, and for residents who don't have access to um, to air condition, um, who may be more susceptible to heat stress as well. Um, of course, like I said, we'll anticipate experiencing more frequent and intense heat waves. Um, and then we have also seen steady increase in annual precipitation in Boston area over the past 50 years. Um, and also significant increase in the size of the largest rainfall events across the Northeast uh, US uh, country. And so projections are for more rain annually and the larger rain events generally. Um, what you see the charts um, graphic on the, on the left here um, is the projection for the, a 10 year, 24 hour storm. So that is the largest 24 hour rainstorm that is expected to happen on average every 10 years. And this is just a figure typically used for stormwater calculations. Just wanna show you here. Um, and you can see that it's gone up from between 1960 to the latest data that we have in 2014. So um, in the future rainfall projections was calculated for um, the city of Cambridge, but that's something that we can kind of use um, to, to um, uh, kind of use for comparison uh, across the region. One thing to note is that even though more rain is projected, it's also true that more frequent summer fall droughts are predicted due to the combination of early snow melt, slightly less rain in those seasons and warmer temperatures. Um, what you may remember, and you might know about this more than I do, is the uh, severe flooding in, in March, um, springtime, uh, or late winter time of 2010. Um, and um, the Blue Hill Observatory recorded over 18 inches of rain in 17 days. Um, that flooding event led to a federal disaster declaration. And so that March 2010 flooding um, has been used as an example of the type of flooding um, predicted to occur more frequently as the climate warms. Um, that means extreme rainfall amount, falling in the winter as rain rather than snow. Um, and and um, it caused, it's caused flash floods and flood, intense flooding due to um, uh, saturated ground. Um, and so what we see here is um, the mapping of uh, claims, um, uh, flood insurance claims for that um, as a result of that March 2010 um, incident or event in Concord. Um, and it's mapped in, in pair with the FEMA 1% flood, uh, chance flood zone that you see here. So it highlights the severity of the stormwater flooding um, and also the reality that much of the flooding in urban and suburban areas occurs, can occurs outside of FEMA flood zone as well. Um, and you also know in the news recently, storms are happening, extreme storm events are happening not only more frequently, but more intensely as well. Um, again, other hazards for Concord to keep in mind include high winds, hurricanes, tornadoes. Um, the EF1 tornado hit the town of Concord um, in August of 2016, um, and it had the maximum speed, uh, wind speed of 100 miles per hour, according to the storm survey, and the damage left behind um, by the tornado was about a half mile long, and I uh, was able to find one of the image at the lower right corner here to kind of uh, show, visualize that, that damage, um, that implication. Um, yeah, so I'll pause quickly here before I move on um, to the next item to see if you have any question. If you do, feel free to 
um, unmute. Okay, I'll keep going and then we can come back for questions at, at a, in a, a little bit as well. So now I want to show um, what uh, one of the tasks that the uh, Concord local team, um, HMP team has been able to do is to review and identify critical infrastructure. We can't locally identify hazard areas, mainly flooding and fire risk. Um, and what we will also look at next is the anticipated future development location, putting all of that together to better understand the risk. Um, and so what you see, um, the blue are um, flood, locally identified flood, flood, flooded area. Um, the red circles are where um, we've identified as high risk for uh, brush, fi brush fire. Um, yeah. So, and then what you see, um, oh, it's not map it here, but there are, um, and yes, the green dots are those critical infrastructures. So you kind of see how they're um, falling in um, into some many instances, especially with the clusters, but in those uh, identify local hazard areas. And here's just a snapshot summarizing some of the critical infrastructure and facilities. Um, and hazard area identified um, during our discussions to date. Um, this is just uh, by no means comprehensive. It's just um, some highlight just so you see how we capture what is what are critical infrastructure um, and where are the hazard areas. There are approximately 140 critical infrastructures and facilities identified in the town uh, and approximately 53 um, hazard areas, mainly flooding and some brush fires. Um, one thing I would like to note here um, is also given the history and, and the wealth of culture in Concord, we also capture the cultural resources um, uh, that we need to pay attention to, um, to protect, um, you know, to protect them. And, and then, yeah. One of the questions was, what are the numbers on the maps, uh, on the map you just had up there? Yeah. So the numbers are just the ID, the IDs of the different critical infrastructure um, and facilities that I we list here. So at the next meeting and when we have the draft plan ready for um, review, um, for public review, you'll be able, there'll be a list of inventory of all of them um, in there in, in the plan that you can kind of see and understand what they are. Okay. And then last but not least, we also want to think about who will be impacted by natural and climate hazards. Um, one thing to note is that we won't be, that we won't all be affected equally. Um, and so some of us are more physically susceptible to impacts such as heat, um, including young children, pregnant women, older adults, uh, folks with chronic diseases or disabilities. Um, and mo more importantly, people who have limited financial resources who may have more difficulty preparing for and recovering from hazard events. Okay, so with that now, I would like to pause and, um, and, and see if you have any um, pub comments and questions. Um, and I have some prompting questions here for you. Um, if you could take a moment to share in terms of um, what have you experienced at home in your neighborhood regarding flooding, extreme heat, heat waves, extreme storm events within the past five years? Um, and or if you have any concerns, again, about these hazards, um, and if you have any um, real many suggestions that we need to consider um, to include in the plan. Do you have any questions at this point? See if anyone put it in chat. Um, I see Anne Marie has a question. Is the library on the list? Yes, it is. Pamela? <clears throat> Hi, Pamela Dritt, 13 Concord Green, Unit 4. Um, are you considering what we could do with a fleet of electric school buses 
as mobile emergency vehicles, including providing of power to in, in emergencies and as well as goods, as well as them being a resource to balance the electricity grid to reduce the amount of um, storm emergencies that um, cause uh, electrical problems. That's great. Thank you. I think that's a that's a great suggestion. That's definitely something that we I know Concord had done um, a climate action and resilience plan too, and there are um, uh, priority actions related to energy um, and energy resiliency in there. So that's definitely definitely something we will draw, um, and that's exactly it. Like thinking of um, that type of mitigation measures to help kind of uh, prevent. Um, you know, the, the severity and impacts of, of that. So I definitely will note that and include that as considerations as the team work together on, on mitigation measures. It would help uh, make us a stronger distributed grid to have that kind of vehicle to grid battery backup uh, yeah. school bus fleet, as well as save our kids' health because yeah. there's nothing dirtier than a diesel school bus. Definitely very strong synergy between the mitigation side, reducing carbon emissions, but also increasing our energy resiliency, security and, and storage and, and all of that. Thank you. Anyone else? Do you have any concern? Have you experienced um, flooding um, or, or things like that within your neighborhood, in your area? Um, Go ahead, Kim. Um, yes, I, I wondered um, what you have in mind as far as um, the Superfund site, the NMI site. Um, what do we have in mind? As far as um, uh, um, making sure that, you know, for example, drought or storms might um, interfere with the remedy there or you know, in other ways um, uh, cause unanticipated problems. Okay. Um, I personally don't know, but that's definitely a good discussion point I will bring back to the team. I know there's some folks on the call right now. I don't know if you would like to respond to, to, to Kim's question. Hey, man, this is... Uh... Is that Chris? Yeah, sorry, this is Chris Carmody. I'm the uh, town's risk manager. It's uh, 2229 Main Street is a site that the town is considering buying. It's a super fun site. It's not owned by the town yet. Um, and it's that, you know, there's an evaluation process going on right now. Thank you, Chris. I have a question in the chat. Have we identified subterranean sites that could serve as refuge in tornado or other storm situations? Um, again, really good question. That's definitely something we will um, talk about in when we develop um, kind of the, the recommended mitigation measures for these extreme um, storm events and, and weather events. Um, Andy? Uh, it might have been in your list. Uh, I didn't do the speed reading part, but I just wanted to make sure that you consider the uh, roofing that one of the disasters is having a very heavy snow file, snowfall and some of the roofs are, are issues. So maybe when you're doing your survey, maybe check out the roof, you know, get some idea of what they can put up with. It's not just the roads you have to worry about with snow. Sometimes yeah. buildings collapse. Yeah, um, we'll have to go back and um, and to be completely honest, I can't remember um, if that was something included in the 2017 plan, but that's definitely something, um, one of the mitigation measures often included um, for um, hazard mit mit mitigation plans for municipalities in New England. <laughs> definitely like that roofing assessment, for sure. Thank you, Andy. 
Anyone else? All right, well, keep thinking about it um, between now and the, the next, this next um, three or four weeks. If you, you know, after this meeting, if, if something comes up, if you think of something, um, please do not hesitate to reach out. And, and I have my contact information at the end as well. So I'm gonna keep going a little bit and, and hopefully to get um, you folks out of here early. Um, and so, you may be questioning what or feeling that we have done something like this before. We have been doing climate vulnerability assessment. Um, and you're right, you have been um, in Concord. There's a similarity between the vulnerability, uh, municipal vulnerability preparedness program, uh, which is a state program that Concord is participating in. Um, and this hazard mitigation plan is a uh, federal program. So it really set the town up for great success and also for you know, pursuing grants, both at state and federal level. Um, again, hazard mitigation plan kind of focused primarily on the weather related hazards. And so the big connection is how climate change is impacting future weather events. Um, and you know, the, the focus um, in the hazard mitigation plan when looking at measures is to focus on taking preventative steps to address um, these natural hazards. Um, and again, the MVP program um, is sponsored by the state, focuses on climate related hazard, um, you know, and on the three different criteria uh, categories here the, the natural environment, um, physical infrastructure, as well as social implication. Um, and uh, just rest assured that we will be pulling a lot of great information, including community feedback and suggestions and, and priority actions that identify um, in the MVP plan into the HMP. Um, so none, none of this is going to be a start over or wash, um, but there's just a lot of great wealth resource that we can, you know, leverage from there as well. Um, and just to remind you all if you if you participate in the MVP planning exercise or if you never did um, that uh, the town came up with a list of priority actions um, and again we'll circle back um, considering you know the questions that some of you folks just shared just now as well as the top priority actions um, that have uh, been included in the MVP plan for um, the next five years. Um, and as you can see, they focus on flooding, infrastructure improvements, emergency communications, um, power options, tree management, a lot of um, educational outreach, um, creating database um, and inventories to, to ensure that you are reaching all the different um, populations, especially the vulnerable, the climate vulnerable populations for, uh, for me. Right, and so, What's, here's the remaining next step for the hazard mitigation plan. Um, we'll start um, getting back together with the team to draft or, or develop new mitigation strategies. Some that are still relevant from the 2017 plan that hasn't been able to address, we'll carry that forward as well. Um, and your suggestions today and in the next coming weeks will also be included or help inform um, this strategy development. Um, and then uh, we'll hold an additional public meeting. That'll be the second and final public meeting, again, um, anticipating in November, um, late November sometimes to review um, the findings and recommendations coming out of the, the draft plan. And then we'll submit it to MEMA and FEMA for review. Um, that piece is when it's out of our control in terms of how long they'll take to uh, review, but once we hear back from, from FEMA and then MEMA, um, the town will be able to vote to adopt this plan, which put um, Concord in great status for the, the next five years. And that means you'll, uh, the town will be able to pursue grants, to implement the mitigation measures um, identified in the plan. Um, and if you want to provide any additional comments, like I said, after this meeting, you can contact me via email at vdu at mapc.org. Um, and I would love to hear from you. And um, 
and thank you for your attention today. So I'll uh, open up the line again for any questions or any comments or suggestions you have. Um, but otherwise, I hope to see you again in, in November sometimes at the uh, second and final meeting. I have a question. Yes, Eric. <clears throat> so, um, uh, you know, as mo most are probably aware, uh, New England is probably the, one of the least energy resilient parts of the country. You know, we're at the end of several natural gas pipelines, and it's, you know, we're reliant on uh, power import from Canada and New York. And so, I guess my question is, um, given those lack of energy resources, uh, what are the plans, or what can we possibly do to um, you know, handle really, really long cold spells. You know, we almost had rolling brownouts during the the uh, bomb cyclone in 2019. Um, and uh, you know, what can we do to, particularly, you know, in, in the winter time, in the event of a long duration power outage, um, right? That our, our options are really limited. And I, I guess the question is, you know, what can we possibly do, you know, given given what I see as one of our main vulnerabilities. That is a great question, and I would say a million dollar question. Um, you know, I think uh, in all seriousness, locally, um, to Pamela's point earlier about um, thinking about energy storage, um, battery storage, um, thinking about that energy resiliency and security, locally, what can you do to really increase that storage um, capacity? right, um, residential, commercial, municipal operations, mainly to make sure that, you know, at, in the, at the municipal, municipal level, there's, um, those designated shelters or places that, that need it to be, um, can continue the, the operation. There is also a plan for continuity that the, you know, part that, that the town is doing separately as well. So that's a high level response I can give you what locally you can do um, or uh, recommendations of what can do. Um, but at the same time, uh, I am also hopeful that, you know, the state is um, has just released and or is uh, going to release soon the clean energy and um, climate climate and clean energy plan, where they're really looking into you know, um, priority actions to really curb, not only curb the, the carbon emissions, but also really, um, you know, looking into policies and programs to really strengthen um, the grid um, and, and, and working with utility companies, working with another state agency, DOER Energy Resources to really, um, uh, you know, secure, increase our, our energy security and, and resiliency that way. But you're on, you're right about um, you know that to can be concerned about that. Yeah, Andy. Uh, on, on your long list of natural disasters, at the bottom you had earthquakes, and I had to notice there was an asterisk there. Uh, could you explain what that is? And uh... yeah, um, so earthquake is um, the only. Um, natural hazard that does not have climate change consideration as of right now that we know of, right? <laughs> um, and also a very, a fairly lower risk um, for New England. As I say that, I also remember there was um, an earthquake more down in Virginia, DC area that we felt an impact up here, but it is considered, you know, among the list of priority um, of hazard, it's, it's lower on the, on the totem pole. Um, so that's why that was one point that I meant to make and I forgot to. So thanks for the reminder. I guess the related question is um, when we're looking at these different hazards, right? Many of them have similar types of effects, right? They knock down power lines, they damage infrastructure, they, you know, pollute water purification systems. Um, I guess what duration of outages or what duration of impacts are we looking at, right? You know, traditionally, um, power plants keep fuel for a few days. Um, hospitals are required to have diesel fuel for three days of operations. But if you look at, let's say, Puerto Rico or you know the west coast of Florida, um, right, they're seeing outages of weeks, if not months. And so, it, you know, the uh, main question is what what duration of outage um, and what you know period of restoration are, are we planning for, given that. 
you know, the, the traditional rules of thumb really don't apply anymore in terms of uh, preparedness. Um, I don't want to put Walter on the spot, but I think you, as an emergency response responded, might you have an answer to that, Walter? <laughs> like, what is the rule of thumb? Oh, Eric, thank you very much uh, for that question. Uh, actually, I'm currently right now in Florida, uh, the state of Florida, helping out with those uh, disaster and relief outfits. And I was also uh, spent 19 days in Puerto Rico. I can tell you this right now. Uh, one of the things that happens is you just mentioned it, uh, hospitals. A lot of a lot of things are uh, requesting resources. In the state uh, state of Florida, uh, who was I thought very prepared for this, could not keep up with those resource demands. Everybody's asking for fuel. Everything's asking, everybody's asking for generators. So it's very difficult. However, uh, one thing I, I would say is that part of it is we're planning for that. This, this is the conversations we're, we're doing uh, internal and ex external stakeholders. We're reaching out to them, asking them for their input. There's been some valuable talk here. Um, but at the same time, we do have some local resources near our council. Uh, they have generators. So if it was an isolated uh, event here in Concord, uh, we could handle that to some degree. But if you're talking a, a statewide uh, event, that is going to require MEMA and FEMA uh, to assist us with that. Uh, you're very fortunate, myself and the fire chief uh, have the credentials and, and, and understand that. And we have, a, uh, during COVID, we uh, acted as the emergency operations center. We, we made an EOC and we brought all of our department heads in. So we have trained for that to some degree and we have seen the tornadoes. So, but some of large scale, I'll be honest with you, it, it's going to be a tax. It's going to, it's going to burn the, uh, the entire system. So. I guess one thing I would offer is um, I lead a group at MIT Lincoln Lab. We do actual power outage exercises for the Department of Defense, and we've we've been heavily involved in large scale exercises. Uh, I also deployed to Puerto Rico for about a week after the the disaster there back in 2018. Um, so I'd be happy to to uh, to help out in in some way if if it's interested. Actually, Eric, it's funny you say that we're having Mass Maritime uh, do a. Uh... A tabletop exercise with actually that thing we're, we're going to do an outage for cmlp so i would actually love to hear you you can reach out to me uh please email me i would love to, for you to have some of that uh input on that on a, uh, a brownout if you want to call it very good um scott had a question in the chat here. I'm curious what control influence the town does or doesn't have with regard to river levels during flooding events. Um, for example, upstream, downstream dam management, exactly. Are there emergency measures that can be put in place during extreme events? Um, I don't know. I can't speak to the emergency, uh, emergency measures. I assume yes, in their emergency response plan. Um, but as part of this hazard mitigation plan, this is the exact um, opportunity where we can look at different nature-based solution, green infrastructure, um, increasing um, pervious surface and things like that to really help um, kind of, you know, reduce that um, chance and risk of flash floods and or, uh, uh, or retrofitting or culverting right sizing to, to help kind of reduce that, that um, that flooded those flooding events. Um, one thing that I am excited and anticipating, I know it's been a few years also, but um, I know Mass DOT has been, um, uh, I don't know if they're doing it in-house or, or having someone to uh, consult and support on that, but they are trying to map inland flooding, um, riverine flooding as well. So once we have those, those that kind of data, it will be helpful to like really drill down and, and do, um, you know, the, the, uh, for these type of planning. But um, I would say at this point, thinking about nature-based solution, um, including in dam management and control, just exactly like you said, Scott, um, are some of the the measures that we will continue to include and and um, pursue for um, grant support, uh, funding support for implementation and things like that. Any other question? Kim? Oh, yeah, Kim. Yeah. Um, if you wouldn't mind taking the time, um, I live right on the border between Acton and Concord, so hazards from both sides are pertinent to me. Uh, would you be willing to take the time to review just in the last five years what um, uh, mitigation measures Concord has taken and have 
um, has Concord had any of these um, grants from um, the hazard mitigation um, program that were that the town is now eligible for for the last five years? Um, yeah, so that would be the next exercise reviewing um, the mitigation measures. Um, if the 2017 plan is um, is public. So you can see the hazard mitigation plan I'm referencing. So I can follow up with you after to share that and to so that you can kind of see the mitigation measures. Um, in terms of uh, whether the different grants pursued, that's something I can look into as well um, with FEMA database. Okay. Yeah, so I've, I've actually taken a look at the um, at the Concord 2017 plan, but I just wondered what of that has been done since, but um, that would be great. I'll, I'll email you separately. Yeah, so part of um, the next step is that um, we'll review kind of all the different mitigation measures that have been included in the 2017 plan, and, and that's where we'll learn also what has been done. Uh, we started that too, but that, will, um, you know, but it hasn't been completed, um, and what needs to be reprioritized and or move forward into the, the this 2022 plan. So at the next final meeting, um, that's something I can speak to then. Thank you. Thanks. Okay. Any other questions or or um, comments? Um, if not, I can let you out 15 minutes early um, to enjoy the rest of your evening. Again, thank you so much for your time um, to join us today uh, and provide your comments and have your questions. They're all great. And that's something I will uh, look forward to reporting back to the local team and discuss at, at our next meeting. Have a good night.